Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Aliens and UFOs video. Alright, another entry here based on one of your past suggestions. This one from a suggestion a little less than a year or so ago. And the reason I picked this one is after looking at the information, it seems like while this is not the very first UFO encounter within, I guess, either the United States or anywhere else in the world, it still is a landmark, almost hallmark case, because it pretty much started it all when it came to the modern world of UFO sightings and UFO encounters. I guess you could call it, it started the golden age of UFO encounters itself. So, very interesting stuff. I had not heard of this gentleman before, but after reading this information, you can see why his case remains one of the most prominent ones out there even after multiple decades to this very day it still remains very important it has to do with this it's known as the Kenneth Arnold UFO case and it happened a little bit back towards 1947 era so here's all the information associated with this landmark case so who was Kenneth Arnold well by all indications all the information I was reading about him he's a man that was somewhat like well respected like within his community he was someone that grew up in Scobie Montana uh, he was someone that was avid in the business world there um, he started his own company even something called Great West fire control supply and all he did was just build that business around it and became a prominent community member and one of his hobbies it seemed like was I don't know if this was actually another job that he had or if it was a hobby itself but he was someone that was an avid pilot so he was able to do a lots of hours in fact in total he was able to do over 9,000 total flying hours, much of it dedicated to search and rescue missions. Now, I'm mentioning all this because it's important to realize later on when he was giving testimony and interviews regarding his encounter, this played a very large role because lots of people were more prone to believe him because of his prominent stance. So here's what happened. Um, so back in 1947, June 24th to be specific, this guy, uh, Kenneth, was on another flight, in this case flying from Chihalas, Washington, to another place, uh, Jakima, Washington. And the reason for it was because he was uh, trying to find something, I guess it was a airplane, something involving a U.S. Marine Corps C-46 transport airplane that crashed somewhere near Round Main or Round Rainer. So when that happened, I guess the U.S. Army was offering a reward, five thousand dollars, in fact, when it came to f uh, discovering uh, the crash site of this location. So he, there he was, trying to make sure he could find it. I guess after a good while, he decided to give up. Um, but imagine this, like these are the circumstances involving a situation like this. If he hadn't had given up, if he had, let's say, continued the search, who knows where history could have changed afterward. It's almost like that sliding doors effect because right before about 3 p.m. that same day, a couple minutes before, he was about 9,200 feet in the air. He gave up his search and then decided to go back eastwards towards Yakima. Uh, Washington and right when he was doing that that's when he noticed this there was a bright flashing light almost like the way he described it sunlight being reflected from a mirror coming from one of the sides of his plane clearly you know interested in seeing what it was <clears throat> He looked around him to see if it was an aircraft, but it wasn't. I believe he was the only one nearby, or there was another plane, a DC-4, but it was miles away, apparently like 15 miles away or so, so nowhere near his approximation. Then a little while later, he saw more flashes of light. Uh, he just he estimated, uh, in this case, the flashes of lights being close to Mount Rainer, somewhere north, about 20 to 25 miles away, still thinking that there might be reflections of some kind, he did some quick tests on his plane because he wanted to get that thought out of his head. This included taking his plane and rocking it a little bit from side to side, I guess, trying to make sure that the flash of lights uh, went parallel to his glass so that way he can say, oh, okay, so it is something involving a reflection in my mirror. He also took off his glasses. He also rolled down another side window, I guess the one that gave him a better view about this, but no, these reflections, these flashes of lights were still coming from far away. 
And the way he saw it was they were in a long chain, something almost like a flock of geese. That was another thing that he was thinking of when it came to whatever these things were. But that was quickly ruled out because of this prominent thing. These things, whatever they were, they were going at a very, very fast speed. I'll talk about that here more in a minute. But um, it, when he was uh, guesstimating how quickly they were going, no chance that this was going to be geese. And at one point, these things... Um, because they were getting closer and closer to him. In fact, they were quickly approaching him. He tried to see that, okay, it has to be some kind of aircraft. So maybe it had something involving a, a tail, like a jet tail, those uh, the streams of whatever it is that comes out of the back of a jet that indicates that, yes, it is indeed a flying aircraft. But no, there wasn't any within any of those aircrafts, or I'm sorry, any of those flying objects. So these things quickly approached uh, this guy, Kenneth, and when they did, uh, I'm sorry, they approached Rainer, which in turn got closer to him, Mount Rainer, and when he did so, uh, he was able to see that that, that, that they looked something like this. They were thin, they were flat, because of the look, I guess, of their color, they were almost invisible. They had this weird crescent shape. I guess the closest thing you could think of is almost like a caricature of the moon. You know how in those old uh, black and white movies, how whenever they showcased the moon, they always showed it in a curved manner with like some spiky edges. That's what it looked like in that regard with him the way he was describing it too and there were a total of nine objects all together flying around this was really interesting too the way they were flying was not in a straight line not like you would think again like a flock of geese would or like any other aircraft that are flying together no in this case they were flying in a very weird almost undulating manner the way he described it was it was almost like they were skipping on water so they would go up they would go down they would go up and they would go down and then in some cases they would disappear behind some of the background like uh, I guess they would get behind some mountain areas or some foliage areas whatever was the case but there they were all skipping around uh, no clear path no clear direction but yet they were traveling at a very fast speed in fact here's how um, how he was able to gauge it it's now that he the, now that these things totally had his attention this guy Kenneth placed their distance first at about 23 miles because in this case he was able to use his skills as a pilot and knowing the areas around there to guesstimate that yes where he was compared to where they were uh, they were about 23 miles away and then later on he was able to take a look and then see what it was in terms of their uh, speed because based on one position he timed it I guess he had like a stopwatch or something he timed it from one area to another area and then he was able to calculate that based on that distance and then based on the time involved um, in this case a distance of about 50 miles in less than a minute and 42 seconds the way he described it then it was 1700 miles per hour now that's going past conservative approach because he toned it down a little bit he said even then if he took a more conservative stance it would be 1200 miles per hour but that's beyond the sound barrier and nothing during that time period at least that he knew of would be breaking the sound barrier and going well beyond it so that's how in that case he was realizing this is something completely otherworldly nothing like anything anyone else has seen before let alone of something flying like this fast nothing else on earth could produce something that with that speed and he was able to get more details about how these things look their their size to be specific he was originally estimating them to be about 60 feet or so in length but whenever he was gauging a closer observation of them and then comparing them to some of the other airliners that he knew considering the width considering the span he was able to then estimate that it was about a hundred feet in length so larger in this case than a DC-4 airliner at least more than a hundred feet or so and then others that have taken a look at his description and again you're you've been looking at some of those photos they estimate it's about 140 to 280 feet this is because he wasn't actually the only person to see these at that time there were other observers on the ground just people regular civilians people that um 
just by pure happen chance happened to be at the right place looking upwards and then seeing these things too so that also helps corroborate his information too because others were doing it at the same time but that was it he saw these things going uh, I guess towards Mount Rainer and then they just went elsewhere like there weren't um and like going into any area that he was going to they just simply went off into the distance and that's at least to my knowledge remains the only thing the only encounter that he had with these specific uh, UFOs but others of course like I mentioned earlier did uh, he was able to um, uh, inter uh, go to his original destination it was another Air Force I believe it was or some other location that he landed in but he was able to um, mention to the people there beforehand like hey you know this is what I saw this is what I encountered word quickly spread he was able to have uh, reporters come out and I was mentioning earlier that the uh, like one of the reporters from the local newspaper there from the Richland Washington villager uh, him and other reporters stated that when they were interviewing him there was just this immediate notion that what he was describing was believable because of his manners because of his confidence because of who he was again the prominent stance the businessman that he was within the society um, everyone that was listening to it was not in a position to dismiss it so much so in fact that he almost got a following of some kind this guy Kenneth if you could believe this um, others that read the stories from the newspapers started coming to him asking for I don't know like they saw him almost like a messiah figure of some kind like they actually believed that because he saw these things that maybe he in turn but uh, was put into an elevated position um, but he was stating that he received letters from people all of them of course believing him like they weren't calling him what he described like a crackpot or anything along those lines no um, they were uh, there were people that were wanting to talk to him there were people that were sending letters people that were just uh, stating that yes you know they, they believe exactly what he saw and, and that they see this as a sign of things also there was a preacher that mentioned that uh, he was telling his people there that this was a sign of dooms like there was a doomsday harbingers of doomsday is how this preacher described it he even encountered a woman somewhere in a cafe who had heard about him saw him and then went out running out of the cafe shrieking telling people you know this is the guy that saw the men from Mars and that she had to do something to help out her children or some other children altogether so unfortunately Kenneth got a lot of prominence from this encounter once it went I guess you the closest you call it there to being viral and it, it gave a lot of undue unwanted attention to him he almost uh, regretted it he said this whole thing has gotten out of hand uh, he didn't want it. he wanted to have his normal life back and the reason why this is pretty prominent I mentioned earlier this is not the very first UFO encounter there have been plenty of other ones um, if you go even to the to the hieroglyphics and other markings, you know, spanning thousands of years back, this is not the first one. But the reason why it remains like the most common one cited for the golden era or the golden age of UFO encounters is because just a little while later, I believe less than a month's time, that's when the uh, infamous Roswell UFO happened. So it was almost like a one-two punch. This story involving Kenneth's story going viral, and then the other thing involving the uh, supposedly crashed UFO there in Roswell, all of that just started a fuel like uh, there was a fire starting on the fuel when when it came to this 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 UFO phenomena so it just grew from there so that's why his re case remains a hallmark within this time period but that's it that's really all the info tied to this Kenneth Arnold UFO case uh, lots of good info to share it seemed like he was someone that that uh, because he was so believable um, he was humbled, I guess, by this, but at the same time, he felt that he wanted to make sure that people believed him. And so it'd be interesting to see if uh, if, if later on, uh, I was trying to see if there was any info about people, I guess, turning on him. You know how those things go. People hold someone high and then later on give them enough time, then they tear them down. But I wasn't able to find anything with that, too. By the way, the military did an investigation into his story and their official stance later on, their public conclusion was, 
that what he had seen was a mirage. So that's another interesting tidbit to mention here too. So, but if anyone has any other info, any other relevant item that 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 you feel is great, uh, please post those comments below. That'd be really great to hear. So, all right, everybody. Thanks again as always. Take care.